Good evening and thank you for watching. My name is Dylan Rosenblatt and I'll be the moderator for this evening's debate. The Citizens Clean Elections Commission is the sponsor for this event. As the state's voter education agency, Clean Elections hosts debates so voters have the opportunity to hear directly from the candidates, ask questions on the issues that matter most to them, and vote informed. Candidates that have a contested general election have been invited to participate in the debate. Candidates that have opted into the Clean Elections Clean Funding Program are required to participate, while traditional candidates are invited and encouraged to attend. As the moderator, I will ensure candidates have the opportunity to engage directly with their respective opponents. The questions that will be asked this evening are coming directly from the voters. Leading up to the debates, Clean Elections conducted outreach to voters across the state soliciting questions for the candidates. Voters that are watching this debate live, you can submit a question at any time by email at debates at kc-a.com, by text at 928-362-1062, or by calling it in at 480-937-1297. Please specify if your question is for a specific candidate or for all candidates. We, we screen questions for clarity to eliminate duplications, speeches, or personal attacks on candidates. The debate is scheduled for one hour, so we may not get to all audience questions, but we will do our best. Candidates, you will have one minute for your opening and closing statements and one to two minutes for your responses to voter questions. We encourage an open exchange of dialogue between opponents. If you feel the need to respond to another candidate's comments, you may do so. I may limit responses for time management purposes, and we remind the candidates and the audience that this is a respectful, courteous, and professional environment. Our goal tonight is con to connect candidates and voters so our electorate may vote informed. Candidates running for the Senate or the state Senate are James C. Tepeshlikai, who is running unopposed and cannot be with us tonight. Candidates running for the State House are Jim Parks, David Peelman, and two incumbents, Representative Orlando Teller and Representative Myron Sosi. Both of Teller and Sosi declined to participate in tonight's debate. The order in which the candidates will speak has been determined by alphabetical order by last name. So let's begin with Mr. Parks. Well, thank you. <clears throat> I appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Jim Parks, Yat Esh, Jim Parks in Sha, Coconino County Supervisor for District 4, Adona Nish Lenegi, Tohono Autumn, Ea Keklahadene, Ado Bilagane, Bashichin. My platform is about the same as any Republican. I am pro life, pro Second Amendment, I am pro Constitution. I, uh, I am a veteran of the Vietnam War, U.S. Navy. I participated in, in the, uh, the Vietnam War from a distance. I'm not a war hero. Uh, Vietnam was nothing but a blue line on the horizon for me. I was a, a, a deckhand on, a, on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. Um, I have been a cowboy, working cowboy for 38 years and um, Agriculture is kind of in my blood and um, in my soul. Uh, I'm past a minute, so I'm going to stop and let Mr. Peelman speak. Go ahead, Mr. Peelman. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me to this. And uh, good evening, Jim, again. Thank you. My name is David Peelman. For those that may not have heard me or read about me before, uh, I'm a resident of Sholo, Arizona, more specifically Vernon, Arizona. I work in Sholo as a realtor. I came to Arizona not as a native-born son, but as a conscious decision in my adult life after I retired the second time from the military. I'm a 25-year military veteran of both the Army and the Coast Guard. I retired in 1996, and after 9-11, I was recalled for another four years, and uh, went off and did what I was supposed to do. After retiring the second time, I, I couldn't wait to get back to Arizona where I had joined the service originally. I got into this race about 14 months ago uh, for a variety of reasons. Number one among those reasons is a lack of representation 
from our current incumbents. Um, since that time, a lot has transpired in our nation and in our community and in this district. I have traveled this district from one end to the other, north, south, east, and west, and I will continue to do so. I've spoken to many, many folks in this district, and to this day, uh, they still don't know who their current representatives are. My name is David Fieldman. I want to be your representative. I want to earn your vote and trust. Thank you. Thank you both for your opening remarks. Uh, let's start with the first question, which is for both of you. Uh, we'll start with you, Mr. Peelman. Uh, what would be your first piece of legislation that you would file if you were elected? The very first piece of legislation uh, versus the very first act. Uh, first piece of legislation, I wanna strengthen our education system and that's through ESAs. I want to ensure every family has a right to send their children to the school of their choice. We had a strong leader in the Senate who unfortunately will not be returning. I've made a promise to her that I will pick up that guide on and continue her good work. Mr. Parks. Well, I think that um, I would like to work with Mr. Peelman with education. I would also like to uh, set, set out some agriculture um, um, legislation, primarily water legislation to protect water for agriculture. Um, I would also like to um, explore term limits for some of the folks uh, at the local levels. So let, let's go into that a little bit further. Uh, I know term limits is something that has come up in this legislature, has not gone anywhere yet. Uh, it's an issue that comes up in several states, and it's something that I think voters are interested in on a federal level as well. What do you propose for term limits? Uh, considering right right now, uh, there you can serve up to four consecutive terms in one chamber and then switch to the other. I was not talking about the legislature necessarily. I was more referring to term limits for, um, in my opinion, I've been a county supervisor for three and a half years. We have people on the board of supervisors who have been there for 20 plus years, several of them. Um, and my opinion is this, if you spend more than 20 years as a, as a public servant, you're not really a public servant anymore, that's a career. So I would like to change that, give young people and people who haven't had the chance to become local, um, public servants to do that. And I think that once a person gets gets in there, they, they're, they're an incumbent and they have an advantage over anybody that, that uh, challenges them. And I think that needs to be changed. Mr. Peelman, where do you stand on that? Uh, I'll uh, put an exclamation mark on Mr. Parks' comments. And more specifically to Apache County where I live, we have Board of Supervisors, one of which has been there since 1994, with the exception of one tour on the Navajo Nation Council. Apache County routinely ranks at the very bottom of prosperity in our nation. And you would think that an individual that had been there that long would have done something to enhance the livability and prosperity of our county here, which is in LD7. I would, I would put limits on it. Uh, they, they have made a career of it. They are not serving the people uh, at the county level or the district level. Let somebody new, fresh, get in there, make something of it, do the best they can, then get out. If eight years is good enough for a U.S. president, eight years is good enough for a county supervisor. Do you think that's just for county supervisors or would you want that for other offices that people would elect? Because I know uh, it's a big issue that keeps coming up of, of this career politician. And a, a lot of the time it comes up with the, the new people who are freshmen uh, running for the first time or uh, have been just recently reelected who then become career politicians by staying in their elected office for a long time. Yes, in general, I'd say eight years is plenty enough time in one position to accomplish something worthy. If you haven't, you should have been out of there long before that. But eight years is more than enough time. I would, in general, put that across all the elected positions within a county. 
Now, Apache County, I got to put a caveat with that. Uh, Apache County uh, does not have a, uh, an abundance of attorneys, but I'd put that on the county attorney as well. And you, your very first question, what would be my first piece of legislation? And I said, as opposed to an act. Well, this does not set well with many and many that are in government right now. But there's a Senate Bill 1487 that calls for that any sitting representative can call for an audit of a county. That would be my very first act. That's the promise I've made to the citizens of this community, and I intend to keep it with my very last breath. We need to audit this county. It, it is, it's in terrible, terrible, terrible shape. And bo both of you mentioned education, uh, something along the lines of education with the first piece of legislation you would file. Let's, let's stick with that topic because there's a lot to talk about for education. Uh, specifically that came out of the Navajo Nation in the 2019 legislative session. Obviously that was a year ago, but it's the, the empowerment scholarship accounts, which Mr. Pillman, you brought up, uh, is a pressing issue of, over school choice. Uh, I'm curious how, the, how both of you think that whole situation went down with the superintendent of public ed, uh, instruction sending a letter to the families of parents on the Navajo Nation over them using their ESAs to travel across the state line into New Mexico. Mr. Park, let's start with you. Well, I think that <clears throat> that was an unfortunate um, occurrence. We had um, people whose children were going to school in, in uh, one state uh, when well, they lived just a mile from the, the state line. Or and, and that that's tragic because they were they were traveling uh, many miles to to a school in 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 the other state, and um, I think that uh, when when that was resolved, that was a plus for Arizona education, and and um, it was a real um, sad thing that that came to pass because it hurt a lot of people, hurt hurt uh, hurt families in in Window Rock. Mr. Pillman, let's go to you. And I do have a follow-up that will ask both of you as well. Okay. I was sitting in the gallery of the House of Representatives uh, the day that this ESA with this particular family, families in Window Rock was voted on. Uh, I heard the words of the current seat warmers of LD7 say that the Republicans were pandering to their people. I take exception with that. I see the parents, any parent, whether they're Native American or non-Native American, as the final arbiters and deciders of their children's education. They were trying their best to give their children the best education they could through the ESA. And these two seat warmers shot it down. Um, that is tragic. Uh, this is... This, this goes against the grain and the values of not only the native Navajos, but all Americans. Let the parents do this. This is not the first time and it's not new. Uh, ESAs are used throughout Arizona, across the borders. But to be told we are pandering because they're native is a slap in the face. And, and then my follow-up is, obviously there was a bill that ended up getting uh, the Governor Ducey signed this year that kind of put an end to that problem with the, on the Navajo Nation at least. There was another bill out in Colorado City that did not go through the legislature due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the session obviously ended quicker than, uh, or I mean, there, there's a lot, there, there's a whole process to uh, the session not being uh, normal than yep. pre previous years. But my question is, do, do you support uh, ESAs being allowed to use across the border in, in any of the states and in Mexico? In general, yes. Yeah, uh, because we're talking about Arizona citizens and what's best for their children and what the state of Arizona can do. Uh, this is, we have Mexican nationals using ESAs. So it's not new, it's not, it's not novel. So, so you do support uh, Arizona residents to use to go to schools outside of Arizona lines, even if it's not on the, the reservation. 
to use there, their ESAs there. Yes, I do. They're okay. Arizona citizens, Arizona children, and we should be looking out for the best interests of both the family and the children. Mr. Parks? I believe in school choice, and that is a school choice. And if, if the residents of, of Colorado City have, have uh, a better, easier um, school access in, in the state of Utah, then I'm all for that. Um, the ESAs can be used to, uh, to uh, reimburse the neighboring state for that, that student or those students that are using that uh, um, academic opportunity. And so I'm with Mr. Peelman, I believe wholeheartedly in, in using the ESAs. And he's right. We do have Mexican nationals that live on the opposite side of the border in Agua Prieta and in, in Nogales. And uh, they do come across the border to go to school in the United States. Now I'm fine with that. And sticking with education, uh, coming up on the ballot in November, there is a ballot prop proposition that is known as Proposition 208, also known as Invest in Education. Uh, Mr. Parks, let's stay with you. Uh, I'm curious, uh, and just to refresh everybody's memory on what Invest in Education would accomplish if proved by the voters, it would tax the highest income earners on taxable income above $250,000, or if, if, if filed by couples over $500,000 and is expected to raise about $900 million for public education. So for the both of you, and again, let's start with Mr. Parks, I'm curious, do you support this? And if you don't, how do you think is the best possible way to raise money for public education in the state? Well, <clears throat> to begin with, um, Governor Ducey last year was asked by the um, teachers unions to, um, Come forth with a five percent increase in in the weight in the uh, spending for for teachers, and he resisted that. And Red for Ed came out, and they put somewhere around three thousand people on the streets of Phoenix around the Capitol. He relented and immediately came back with a twenty percent increase, which didn't seem to be enough for the teachers unions. But um, I think that that was a real asset that twenty percent increase. That also not only raised the, uh, the bar for the teachers, but uh, as, the, as the wages increased, but it also increased the number of applicants for teaching positions in Arizona. So there was a positive effect there. Um, as for this Prop 208, um, what, what we have there is an increase in, in capital, perhaps, for, for the teacher, for the, uh, for the school systems. But as usual, there is no um, oversight on that to, to actually put it towards salaries for teachers. A lot of times these increases go towards administrative, administrative costs and administrative personnel and their um, salaries. So I, I am ap in opposition at this point to Prop 208. I don't think that it's productive to be going that way with a massive tax increase that will benefit the people who need it the least. The teachers are the ones that need it the most. So how, how, do, you, how do you propose uh, public education receives more funding considering the reasons why this is a ballot initiative in the first place is because these teachers and these education groups believe that they are severely underfunded. Well, like I said, the governor gave them a 20% increase last year and that wasn't enough. That seems to be what's pushing Prop well, 2. Well, that also ended in 20, 2020 was the final year of that, of that raise. Yes, so now we at the legislative level need to we, we need to go into that. And that's what P Doc, Mr. Peelman and I are talking about. We need to go into that uh, arena with the objective of raising the uh, money for teachers, uh, funding teachers' salaries and not necessarily for funding administrative costs and administrative salaries. So would you propose a, a uh, new version of the 20 by 2020 plan or an updated version, I should say? 
I think that would be advisable, don't you? I'm 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 not the candidate here. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Peelman, let's go to you. All right, Dylan, I, I've been itching to weigh in on this. Let's start off with some facts. The teachers union is a union for and by the teachers, not for the students, correct? That's, correct. Not, a candidate, that's not a candidate question. That's just a statement of fact. We have over 232 separate school districts in the state of Arizona. The average income of a school superintendent is well above $200,000, plus the perks and the travel and what have you with it. I suggest we audit, we change the paradigm. Why do we need 232 school districts? Why do we need to pay $235,000 per suit average to the superintendents? My little school district out here in Vernon doesn't make that. That's for sure. They don't justify that. We're, with the state of Arizona dedicates over half of the entire state's budget to education. And now you want to ask, why don't we raise taxes on specific individuals, specific earners? Well, these earners, these specific individuals you're talking about are generally older, uh, older citizens who have no longer, no longer have children in school. Uh, Again, I say give the choice to the parents. Our schools, by the way, sadly, rank near the bottom in the state, ranking, state rankings. And we spend over half of our budget on it. There is a problem there. We need to streamline, we need to audit, we need to consolidate where we can. We need to get the dollars to the student school desk, not to the administrators. We have wonderful educators and teachers. And yes, they do deserve a good, they deserve the best we can give them, but we got to make sure the money gets to the student's desk and not sitting over there in some administrator's pocket. So no on Prop 208 for you, correct? I think I was pretty clear about that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, move, moving on past education. Uh, one of the big topics right now with only a week left to go is the census. Uh, there's September 30th is the final day that uh, states were given to have all of their residents fill out this the census information. Part of your district that you both are running in is Legislative District 7, which covers uh, the Navajo Nation, which has severely uh, been undercounted in the past and is continuing to be undercounted right now. I'm curious what have either of you done to help with the citizens to make sure that they get counted this time? Or what do you plan to do given that there's only seven days left and each percent that is not counted in the state is hundreds of millions of dollars that will be lost in federal funds for the next decade? Mr. Peeling, let's stay with you. All right, we've got some, uh, we got some problems that are new this year that we haven't encountered before. And many of these problems are self-induced, specifically the lockdowns on the Navajo Nation. Uh, there's very little any candidate can do to go out there and say, hey, hey, go sign up for the census, go get counted. Uh, we, can, we put it out on our websites. We've spoke to people in person at different meetings, meet and greets, rallies, and so forth. Um, it's up to the individual citizen to do their duty to be counted. That is the fundamental point of it. Be counted. Uh, you can say this until you're blue in the face, but unless you have a Navajo Nation government that wants to have everybody counted and allows everybody to be counted, it won't happen. And you're correct. We're losing out on millions of dollars because our district, which is seven counties, eight Native American tribes, are hamstrung. So there's, you have two competing government systems going on at the same time. Uh, it, it's, it's walking a tightrope, juggling chainsaws. Mr. Parks? Well, <clears throat> I believe that, you know, in my, in my supervisor district, about half my district is Navajo and Hopi at, the, at, at this time. We have been doing our best at the county level to get the word out, to get the, the word out to everybody, not only on Navajo, but off Navajo, to be counted. And um, 
there's a lot of fear on Navajo and they have a, they have a curfew and they've just gone back into their 57 hour um, weekend curfew as of today. Um, they have a curfew at night from uh, nine o'clock at night till five o'clock in the morning. And then on the weekends, it's nine o'clock on Friday night until uh, five o'clock on Monday morning. So there's serious uh, mo mobility problems on Navajo and Hopi. Not to mention the fact that there have been so many folks that have died from this virus, people are scared to death. And so they're not wanting to have census workers prowling through their villages. Many of the Hopi villages are just locked completely down. They have guards at the entrance roads to the villages and you have to be a resident and prove you're a resident of the village to get in there. They also uh, take down your name when you leave the village when you, and when you come back. So things are serious out there. And I believe that we need to extend the deadline by a couple of months on the census, just so that we can make a, a better attempt to get everybody counted. At this time, things are in bad shape. Uh, roads are in bad shape because of the drought. We have roads out there that are um, main thoroughfares to, to and from places. And the dryness has made those roads impassable because they turn to sand dunes. They turn to sand pits. People are getting stuck. Um, Supervisor Fowler, my, my counterpart on the board, she, and she had to go out and help her brother get out of a, of a situation where he was stuck in the sand in this instance. Um, it took him till three o'clock in the morning to get him out. This is the kind of thing that, that they have to deal with on Navajo and Hopi. We, we need to, at some point, help them to um, improve their road situation. Right now, Coconino County, because we had a Proposition 203 uh, several years ago that we, we obtained more taxes, we also expanded our, our Coconino County road blading system by 233 miles on Navajo. So we're taking care of roads, we're trying to. This drought has made taking care of roads almost impossible. So my, my, my uh, suggestion here is extend the deadline for the, for the census. I, and that was gonna be my next question for, for the both of you, uh, and I'm glad that you brought it up, Mr. Parks. Uh, so a, a lot of people have floated the idea about extending it a month. You said uh, maybe longer than that. How, how long do you think it, you're in, in this situation? How long should it be extended? I would extend it 60 days. Okay. Mr. Peelman, how do you feel about that? Do you think it should be extended as well? I got to look at not only extending the uh, census, but there's also another process taking place now that they want to, uh, some individuals want to extend the mail-in voting time for Navajos specifically. So if you're gonna, I, I look at consistency. What is fair for one is fair for all. Um, we have individuals that are in a, on the nation that are restricting the ability to get the census taken. Um, I'm not for extending the voting period. And I'm not quite sure I'd be for voting, for extending the census taking. I would like to look at that a little bit deeper. Uh, but if you're going to extend one, by right, you would have to extend the other. And I'm not quite in favor of doing that. Yeah, and, and you, uh, I wasn't going to bring up, but you, you mentioned the uh, po possibility of extending voting on the, the Navajo Nation. Uh, that's uh, currently being decided in court right now. Uh, whether they can accept if it's, if the time stamp on the ballot is before election day, if it could still be counted for days after. That's something that you do not support. Judge, Judge Snow, yeah. Uh, Judge Snow is uh, he's off. He has not decided on this yet, but he's offered some indication as to his thinking on this. And I think his thinking is very valid is that you cannot have one specific group of people receiving special compensation dispensation and not give it to all 
what's good for one is good for all. I, I, I believe what he said that with the caveat that unless it, unless there's like actual evidence that shows that they're being specifically targeted here as the only ones who are being affected. Well, who would be targeting them? Well, may, maybe targeting wasn't the correct word, but if they were the only ones who were being affected by this, I think that's something that would go. I think he did it. use the word target. I'm not quite sure uh, okay. of that myself, but that was the inference I gained from it. Okay. That it's a targeted bias towards the Native Americans. I don't see it as such. Mr. Parks? I wouldn't call it bias. I would call it uh, more um, unfortunate circumstances. On Navajo and Hopi, things are different than they are in town. In town, nobody worries about what kind of a road they drive on. They drive on pavement all the time. If they do drive on a, on a, on a dirt road, it's a very short road and it probably is a driveway or something along those lines. Here, you know, um, on Navajo, like I said before, there are significant problems with getting around. However, with the, uh, with the, with the voting, I really think that that is a, is a deadline that needs to be held too, because of the fact that we have to get, by the 1st of, of uh, January, we have to get the people who have uh, won the elections into the office. And it is a it is much better to get them to get that out of the way over with and and the people elected to the offices rather than dragging it out into into January or even February. I do want to tell voters that who are watching this debate right now that you can still submit questions. Uh, you can send it via email debates at kc a.com. You can text in your questions at 928. 362 1062, or you can call them in at 480 937 1297. Let's move a little bit into uh, the what's affected everybody over the past six plus months, and that is the COVID 19 pandemic. Uh, obviously, it, it ended up affecting the legislative session this past year when legislators agreed to sign and die. They were under the impression that they were likely going to come back at some point for a special session that has not happened there's now five weeks before the election it doesn't seem likely that they will go into a special session at any point before the election and probably not after i'm curious mr parks will stay with you right now do you think the legislature should have gone back into a special session and Absolutely. and what what do you what topics do you think they should have focused on well, there were several bills that, that just died on the vine because of that. They were, they were not ever voted on. They, were, they didn't come out of committees. Uh, the process did not happen as it should have happened. And um, I do know that now looking back, we know that with social distancing and, and use of masks and, and hand sanitizer and those kinds of things, the legislature probably would have been all right to, to have gone back and had the votes that, that they needed to take on the legislation that was pending. And um, we, we as, as citizens of Arizona, we, we should have been given that um, courtesy by the legislature. So, do, so you think that a special session should have addressed bills that, that did not go through during the legislative session. It should not have just focused on the COVID-19 pandemic. It could have been open to, to anything. I believe that if the, uh, if the legislature were gonna go back into a special session, they should have done it with the objective of getting through the legislation that had been proposed already. Uh, as far as the COVID virus, that's a different breed of cat. We needed to do certain things at the time, we did not understand what uh, what the um, what all of the the uh, problems were going to be with COVID. We essentially shut down our economy to um, try to save folks in the COVID pandemic. Uh, we we that has been a big problem, and that's a nationwide problem. 
we uh, we were up against having having to um, provide in the, in our county. We were up against having to provide services for people and not knowing if we were going to have the money to cover those services. And as it turned out, we are now being um, overlooked as as uh, having provided those services in the in the area of reimbursement for those services that were promised by DEMA and, and uh, FEMA. So what we've, what we've come down to with this virus is we are still looking at trying to, to um, save people's lives. We are still looking at trying to um, have, have our uh, testing, have the, the, um, the, the, the process and the, uh, the uh, opportunity and the conditions set to be able to try to defeat this virus or at least get us to a point where we can have some kind of a shot that, that will be either a vaccine or something similar to a flu shot that they can target towards the um, mutations of the virus as they, as they occur throughout the population. And we know that mutations are occurring in the, in the uh, COVID virus population. So anyway, um, I'll let Mr. Yeah, let's, let's go to Mr. Peelman. Mr. Peelman, I'll, I'll uh, re-ask the question. Uh, special session was something that a lot of legislators thought was going to happen when they agreed to sign a die. It didn't happen. It still hasn't and likely won't. Do you think the legislature should have gone back into a special session? And if so, what would the topics focus on? Absolutely. They shouldn't have adjourned in the first place, signing die. Uh, once they did so, I don't know what made them think that they were going to come back. Uh, if they had some crystal ball, um, only by a two thirds majority of the houses, of the uh, both houses, can they come back or by the proclamation of not the proclamation by the order of the governor the governor has been acting on a 2001 piece of legislation that gave him very extensive and broad powers for emergencies we're six months into this now this is the only emergency if i've ever lived through that's been six months the the legislators should have come back they should have never left they should have stayed there and done their job we've got soldiers sailors airmen Coasties, police, firefighters that routinely walk into danger, routinely walk into bullets, knowing that their life is at risk. Is a legislator more important than one of those folks? Are they immune from doing their job when there's a little bit of an issue that may face them? No, they should have never adjourned. The governor should not have exercised oh, last count what 46 emergency uh, executive orders edicts um no the legislature should have come back they should have throttled back the governor and his edicts um we have governor christy Nome of south dakota that told her told the citizens of her state what covid was what preparations and precautions they could take but she never shut down her state. They're, they're essentially over the COVID. We're still going through this. We're putting benchmarks, arbitrary numbers here and there. We got morbid, morbidity rates that are, are skewed beyond belief. The mortality rate, which is harder to skew, is 0. 0.0004. You have a greater risk of getting hit crossing the street than you do of getting and dying from COVID. No, the legislature should have stayed they should have done their job. They should have done what we voted them in to do and what we pay them to do. They're sitting home collecting their paycheck. Granted, it's small, but they're sitting home not doing their job. So you mentioned uh, Governor Ducey, uh, which is obviously, I mean, he's a big part of the situation. Like if he were to call a special session, I believe that there, that's where the legislature stood when they signed he died was that there was going to be an understanding that the governor would have called them back into a special session at some point that did not if it's happen. not written it's not it's not an understanding which, they, which, they're, they're dreaming they they're they're smoking and riding rainbow colored unicorns so governor juicy 
Uh, I'm curious how you think, I mean, you, you touched on it already. And I mean, you pretty much answered the question before I even asked it is it, does he have too much power and should his power Absolutely. Be by the legislature? Absolutely. And so, that's one thing, you know, a governor in any emergency, all of us, we all look to that one person in our counties. We look to the sheriff. He's the single highest elected official in the county. And we look to him or her for the guidance and the direction we need in an emergency, a flood, a fire, a civil uprising. We look to that one individual. And it's the same with the governor. But it should not be an unending rule by edict. So do you not think that the governor, uh, Governor Doug Ducey, should not have issued any state of emergency or shut down the state at all? Oh, we can play hindsight all day long. Uh, we can we can get through an emergency. An emergency doesn't last six months. They're calling this the new normal. That's no longer an emergency. When this hit, none of us, like Mr. Park said, we were all rocked back on our heels. We didn't know what was going on. Is this the, the calamitous event of revelations or what? We didn't know. So we all took a breath. We all stepped back. We all listened. And we all listen to the governor. All right, governor, what are we going to do here? We usurp the U.S. Constitution to save people, which is not in the Constitution. Mr. Parks, how, how do you think Governor Ducey has done so far managing this six-month-long pandemic? I believe that in the beginning, we had things that he did that were okay. I think that at the same time, it's drug on long enough now that not only have, has the medical community gotten better with uh, saving people who come down with this virus, um, but our, our um, counties, our cities have gotten better with uh, dealing with the virus as in the, in the capacity of, of, the, uh, of the businesses that are in their system, which, which I'm, what I'm saying, I, what I mean by that is we are now social distancing. We are now watching what we do. We are now using masks indoors. We, uh, we have uh, protocols for cleaning our hands with uh, not only with soap and water, but with, with, uh, hand sanitizers. We have, we have learned a lot about how to deal with this problem. The only thing that's missing now is a vaccine. Our numbers, the, the original intent of, of all of these measures to combat COVID-19, the original intent was to flatten the curve, knowing at the time, knowing that we were all going to sometime be, be exposed to it and have to depend on our own immune system to fight it. Um, that is something that has gone un as water under the bridge for quite a long time now. Now we want to save everybody and, and everybody would like to be saved. And I'm, I'm sure that that is something that is not, um, not untoward with, with uh, everyone who could come down with the, with the virus. We know that there are certain populations that are more susceptible to it as, as uh, David and I are in, those popu in one of those populations, the over 65 crowd. Um, hey, I'm only 64, Jim. Oh, sorry, Dave. Well, I, I have enough uh, years to, to, to boot to give you one or two to bring you up to speed. There you go, all right. Um, but uh, yeah. This is, this is something that we need to, to solve. This is something that, that uh, we need to look back and, and try to figure out where we started. And where we started was to flatten the curve. That's been done. We have had some spikes in some populations here lately. Navajo Nation has had a spike. They've gone back into their curfew. So, you know, um, I just, we need to open this, this society up. We need to open up our economy. We need to break loose with, with uh, getting back on track. We're, uh, we're spending lots of dollars that have been um, just printed 
And that needs to stop because we are damaging ourselves. I'm sorry, my mother-in-law's phone's going off here. Come on, would you? All right, well, thank you. Uh, Ms. Mr. Pielman, let's go back over to you because I didn't directly ask the same question of you of how, uh, how you think the governor has done overall throughout the past six months. Uh, do you think there's things that you approve of how he has governed or in are there, I'm sure there are, like you said, there are things that you don't agree with. Uh, you know, I, I got a call from a gentleman uh, oh, pretty early on in this COVID business that stated to me unequivocally, uh, Mr. Pillman, it is not healthy to speak out against a sitting governor of your own political party. I have done so, I have written articles to our local paper. Um, you know, I, I gotta call him as a see him. I don't give him a passing grade, no. He went to Washington DC, he's telling us to wear a mask, social distance, social distance, wash our hands, something our mothers told us when we were little kids, and all these little precautions, uh, shutting down class six and class seven establishments and gyms and so forth. Yet he goes off to Washington DC and he's photographed amongst hundreds of people without wearing a mask. Do as I say, not as I do. I, I'm not on board with that, no. Uh, photographed at a small party, again, not wearing his mask. Big deal, that's his personal life. I'll let him live his personal life. But don't expect to tell the people of this state what to do and not set the example. Uh, and that's what I see coming out of that office. Now, we talk about the curve and spikes and all this. We've got some problems that are endemic on the Navajo Nation. One of them, and, it's, and I'm staying on COVID here, is that uh, the traditions and practices of the native Navajos are a bit different than they are for the people in Metro Maricopa. Uh, there's a lack of water, there's a lack of sanitation. This is what needs to be addressed. I've spoken to countless people that have to drive 40, 50, 60 miles in a pickup truck with a water container, get their water, take it back home, do this every two days. They have a single five gallon paint bucket that everybody in their extended family wash their hands in. They're trying to do this, it's not working. Uh, this is where we need the shutdowns of businesses, gyms, and bars, that's baloney. That's baloney. Uh, we need to help the people that have these spikes. We need to get the infrastructure up on the Navajo Nation where they have the means to help themselves. Right now, sitting off in a far off capital, dictating to them what they need to do is not the right answer. So do you think everything should just reopen now and take the same measures they have been taking or do you have a different proposal well you tell me what's the difference between a class 12 and a class 6 restaurant bar one can open one can't why is that they're essentially the same all it is is the licensure of how much food versus alcohol they sell 40 to 60 percent you got this rule no dancing who's going to go to a uh a place of entertainment and enjoyment where you can't dance, where they ask you to go from the entryway of the door to your table with a mask. Once you get to the table, you can take your mask off. These are silly rules. Those are silly, silly rules. And I don't believe it's gov any government's place to tell you how to behave. Now, I do believe a business has a right to operate their business in a business model as they see fit. So going to your question, do as Chris, Governor Christie Noem did, tell her population, her people, these are the issues, these are the precautions, these are the dangers, these are things you can take, do on your own to protect yourself. It's not the government's stated duty to protect people from themselves. So where do you stand on uh, the masks? Uh, I know obviously it was a big debate for a while whether there should be statewide mask mandate obviously the governor never went that far he gave it to gave the opportunity and choice to the local governments the on the city and county level to have their own mask mandates uh most counties and cities took took him up on that a lot didn't do you think there should have not been any 
mandates for masks like on county or city level or do you think that there's rid of it i believe every individual ought to take every precaution that they think is in their best interest to protect them and their families period i do not believe it's a place of the government to mandate what you wear and what you don't wear i personally don't prefer a face diaper you're rebreathing your exhalations what you're trying to get out of your body and you're sucking it back in I have some medical experience with this, and I know there's, good Lord, both sides of the medical house are going to debate this ad nauseum until the, until the cows come home. It's a personal choice. If you want to wear a mask, by all means, wear a mask. If you want to sequester and quarantine yourself in your home, by all means. If you don't want to go to a place of entertainment, a gym, or a pool, don't go. But why are we having a government telling everybody you can't go. Why are we having the governor's attorneys stating on the record in a court of law that they knew there would be winners and losers? Where is it the government's place to pick winners and losers? I'm not of that mindset. Mr. Parks, where do you stand on the, the mask debate? I agree with a lot of what Mr. Peelman says. Um, this should be a personal choice. Um, if you if you feel that you have the the uh, the increased opportunity to get the COVID virus, you should stay home. You should wear a mask. You should do all of the the things that people need to do to to stay safe. If you feel that you can go out in public and um, not come down with a COVID virus or the flu or any other virus, as as we as we've experienced for, for most of our lives until this virus happened to take over. Um, if, if you feel that, that you're in danger, stay home. If you feel that you have a problem with your immune system, stay home. You know, you don't have to go out. There are, there are um, grocery stores everywhere and nearly all grocery stores will deliver your, your items to you, whether it be food or cleaning supplies or whatever it is, they'll bring them to your door. There is no reason to go out in, in public if you don't have to. Um, I don't see that we should punish the entire population to, to have uh, some, some folks who are in a minority be um, at, at ease in, in their, um, in their Now I've drawn a blank. At ease in their particular um, household with this virus. This should not be a one size fits all. This should be if you have the opportunity and you have the the fear of the of danger that you feel that you need to stay home, stay home. Just like Mr. Peelman said, if you feel you need to stay home, stay home. If you if you are going to go out in public and you are 20 to, to 44, which is the largest group that comes down with positive cases in, with this virus, and you're out there at the bars and, um, at, and uh, getting a bite to eat while you're getting a beer, and you're rubbing elbows with the other folks, and they don't have a mask, and you don't have a mask, then you need to th think about what you're doing to your own health and not put it on the rest of us to have to accommodate you. One final question for the two of you, and then we will move on to the closing remarks. Uh, Mr. Parks, we'll stay with you for this one. I'm curious how you plan to cast your ballot this election. Uh, the election is in five weeks. There are several options to do so. You can vote by mail. You can drop an early ballot off at a polling location. You could vote early in person, or you could vote on election day. Uh, I'm curious how, how you plan to do so. I enjoy going to the polling place and casting my ballot, and that's exactly what I'm going to do this year. I've on, always done on election day, or okay, Mr. Peelman, what about you? Yeah, you got a variety of ways to do it, and there's uh, uh, pros and cons of each of them. And just as Mr. Parks enjoys doing, I do as well. I enjoy going to the poll. I enjoy the process of exercising my my hard-earned right to vote. Uh, it seems 
more real to me. Uh, I can sit down here. I can mark an X or a check mark and something, send it off. It doesn't even send real. And then again, you know, it may get lost in the mail, uh, may not get delivered. Uh, there's all kinds of things that could happen. There's pros and cons with each. And I'd like everybody to get to the polls. I, I like to return to that kind of uh, thinking that the election season shouldn't have to go a year and a half in voting a month long. So we have an election day. Just go. Your your employer is going to let you off. There are circumstances where people can't do that, and I understand that, particularly our military. And I've voted by absentee ballot many, many, many times. Um, and we know uh, through different elections, those military absentee ballots aren't counted you know, prior to the announcement of the winner. Uh, I like to know that my vote counts. So I encourage everybody to get out to the polls. Go to the polls. If you need a ride, get a friend, get a family member. Call me. I'll take you. Uh, get out to the polls and vote. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to closing remarks. David, uh, Mr. Pimlin, let's let's stay with you. Uh, what do you want your the voters in Legislative District 7 to know? Well, uh, again, I've traveled this district, and I continue to travel this nation's largest single legislative district. Seven counties, eight Native American tribes, larger than the state of Indiana. Uh, you have entire governments governments to uh, administer land this large. Uh, I want them to know, and they can see by my actions here, by my presence in their homes and their restaurants and wherever we meet, that I'm not a polished politician. I'm not a politician. I'm a by trade, a military man, a licensed boatmaster. Uh, but I saw a need in our community, in our district, where we're not being represented. I think this is felonious. Uh, I think we have two AWOL representatives that are more interested in their personal lifestyles and their personal uh, aggrandizements than they are representing people. Matter of fact, a rep, uh, invited another gentleman and I invited both of our current seat warmers to Vernon for a town hall. One of them had the courtesy to show up. The other one didn't even acknowledge our invitation. The one that showed up then lied straight face when asked a question about abortion. I thought that was a slap in the face to everybody in that room and everybody in this district. Um, like I said, I, I'm a, I'm a citizen servant. I want to serve everybody in this great Northern Arizona district. Um, I've met so many of them, uh, wonderful people, wonderful stories, and they're deserving to be represented, which they're not being represented now. So I, I ask them to trust me and I want to earn their vote and, uh, know that I'm not making a career of this. We, the very, one of the very first questions you had careerism in politics. I think it stinks. I think it creates stalemate in the divisiveness, divi divisiveness that we're seeing right now. Get new people in there. Being in office since 1994, their county supervisor, you haven't done a daggum thing for this county. So uh, my name's David Pillman. Uh, I live in Sholo. I ask for your vote. Thank you. Mr. Parks. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I thank you all. Uh, thank you, Dylan, for uh, sitting in and, and moderating this. I think you've done a good job. And um, thank you, Mr. Peelman, for, for being here as well. I, I enjoyed thank the you, visit here, and I'm, I'm glad that we got to have this opportunity. As far as my personal um, ability here. What I, what I have accomplished in my life is this. I have been in the United States Navy. I served there for four years during the Vietnam War. I was a cowboy for 38 years. All I served there was the ranches that I worked on. However, during that time, I became a, a member of the Farm Bureau, Arizona Farm Bureau and the Arizona Cattle Growers Association. I was a was a member and a, a board member of the Arizona Farm Bureau after I became the president 
of the Coconino County Farm Bureau and Cattle Growers Association. That continued my service to people. I am in the business of service right now. I am a sitting county supervisor in Northern Arizona in Coconino County. I, I feel that I have proven myself to be the kind of a public servant that, that gets along with a certain clientele of people. That clientele of people are the rural people, the people who, who, who are least represented, least represented in our society. Most, uh, most societies, uh, including our Coconino County uh, polit polit politicians, they are Flagstaff centered, they are city centered. Uh, Arizona is primarily Phoenix centered. Not even Tucson is big enough to take that away from Phoenix. We have, we have lots of people who are not represented in this state. And that's where I'm going with this. That's where, why I'm here. That's why I want to be elected. That's why I would like to urge the, the folks out there to take a look at Mr. Peelman and myself. There are two seats in this, in this district to be filled. And I ask you to please vote for David Peelman and Jim Parks for these two seats. And, I, and my, my closing line is gonna be, send a cowboy to the Arizona legislature. This concludes our debate to our candidates. We thank you so much for participating. To the voters, we thank you all for who took the time to watch the debate and inform yourselves before the November 3rd election. The Citizens Clean Elections Commission is your source for nonpartisan voter information. We encourage you to visit azcleanelections.gov for all your voting needs. Thanks again.